Hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Shabal Resh. I am the director of Perusia. We are based in Sydney, Australia, and my talk today is going to be Mary in the Bible as the woman. I want to thank Anne DeSantis and all the team here at uh, Patrick Heart Ministries, Fiat Ministry Network, and then the St. Raymond's Foundation. What you guys are doing is just fantastic. And this Marian Summit, Hope for Families, is a fantastic event. What a great initiative in the month of Mary, which is May. <laughs> so what a beautiful honor to be part of this again. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing this collaborative work uh, with these great ministries and apostolates. Um, let's work together to bring in, in the hope for a world that is so desperate for hope and may it strengthen families around the world. So let's dive into this talk. And I want to invite you, have you ever read the Bible from the very, very beginning? And when you open up in Genesis, you've got the creation story. And then in the creation story, what's quite beautiful, Adam and Eve are created. Then there's an unfortunate scene when they fall into sin, what we call original sin. And then what's interesting, when you dive into uh, original sin, there is what's called the first gospel, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15. And it's God speaking to the serpent who has tempted Adam and Eve uh, to sin, and they've fallen. And God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you, serpent, you, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Now, what's interesting is you, at first glance, you think, is this Eve he's talking about? But here's what's interesting. The opening, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So you're going to be at complete odds with this woman. That means nothing of you, Satan, will be in this woman. This woman will have nothing of you, meaning no sin, no impurity. She'll be pure, spotless, at complete odds with Satan. So Eve has already sinned, so it's obviously not Eve. So who is this woman, this spotless woman that we're waiting for? And then it also said between your seed, Satan, and then her seed. What's also interesting about this opening statement here of uh, the first gospel is women don't have seeds, if you know what I'm talking about, unless she's a virgin. So we're not only waiting for this woman that's spotless at complete odds with Satan, but this woman will also have a seed. And it's impossible unless she is a virgin, because the seed comes from God in this case. She falls pregnant from God. So who is that? I think you know who I'm talking about. The church fathers foreshadow this to be Mary. This is a prophecy of the coming of Our Lady. Now, what's interesting, this is the first good news, uh, the Proto-Evangelism, Proto and this is the announcement of the coming of the Messiah. But the woman is not the Messiah, but although she will crush the head of the serpent, it's the seed of the woman, and that seed of the woman is, you guessed it, Jesus. Now, what's the idea of bruising of his heel? That's the crucifixion. Because remember, right at the beginning, and here's what we have to get right at the start. We cut ourselves from God when you sin. Now, very interesting. Can I give you just a little example of how this works? A lot of people think, why on earth do we get affected from original sin? Let's just get this right, very basically, right from the start. If I was to insult uh, a fellow uh, citizen of mine, and I said to that fellow citizen, something very disrespectful. What would be the punishment for that? I would have to say sorry, and then we'll shake hands, we'll maybe hug it out and just say, okay, we move on. Now, I want you to notice something. If I said the same exact insult, not just to a fellow citizen, but now to a police officer who represents the, the, the state, what would be the punishment? I may have to do a public apology. I may even have to do some community service. What then will happen if I did the same insult to a politician like the president um, or a head of a country? Well, then there may be a fine associated with it. There may even be jail time, depending on, on the country. So you see what's going on here. What about if I did the same insult to the queen or the king? You see the punishment's going to be increased again. So what happens in that case, sometimes, and it's happened in the past, you may have punishment of death. It's high treason against the high king. What is going on? When you sin against a fellow citizen, you can measure 
the, the gravity of that sin because it's between two people. It ends between you two. When you sit against, say, a police officer or someone that represents more than themselves, you're, you're sitting against the state, so to speak. So then you measure that by, by the state. Then the president is the country, and then the queen or the king is the kingdom. Do you see what's going on here? The punishment must fit the crime. The crime is increased based on the measurement of the punishment, based on the sin itself. You're sitting against all of those people represented in that in that space. So the individual, the state, the, the country, the kingdom. See, it increases. The gravity of sin increases, even though it's exactly the same sin, but the punishment increases. So if you can you see that logic, and many, all religions can see this, it's, it's, it's natural law, how the punishment must fit the crime based on, on, on who it's to. What about if you sin against God? And here's where it changes everything. How do you measure God? You can't measure God. And so we need some form of uh, way of paying back that, that, that. How do you pay that punishment? As a human being, you can't. Adam couldn't have said to God, hey, I, it, take, take my life, save Eve. No, God would have said, thank you, but one life is not going to cut it. His children are not going to cut it. His whole generation is not going to cut it. It doesn't matter how many human lives offer themselves as a sacrifice to repay the sin. It's not going to cut it. We need something that represents divinity, infinite value, something that's eternal, but also something that represents humanity. So if, we, if God thinks of a way, if somehow we can have an infinite being, that is representative of God and a finite being, a human being that represents us, then we can get somewhere. We can pay the, the, the debt. We can make up for the sin. And so you guessed it. Here comes the first gospel. So there's a debt we couldn't pay. Adam and Eve couldn't make up for. No human being could. None of the Old Testament and uh, sacrifices could. But this woman and her seed together will be the hope we're looking for. And so the whole Old Testament, it's a good 4,000 years before we see the coming of this woman and the seed. Why did it take so long? It wasn't because God wasn't ready. He was ready right there. It was because we weren't ready. Evidence of this? Cain kills Abel. Does he learn his lesson? No. Noah and the flood. The Tower of Babel. Abraham, as a prophet, sinned multiple times. Isaac. Jacob, you go through all the list of these, these great uh, people, the line of Jesus comes from, and they all have sinned and fallen short. And actually things got worse. There was adultery. There was murder. There was all sorts of um, grave sins that were happening right through, and it was getting worse. And the Jewish people, so even after Moses, they will keep falling into pagan worship. You see, after the Egyptians fell, and then the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, what happened? The Jewish people would, would, would stick together or then they'll have infighting. There'll be splits divided in the kingdom. But then they fall into pagan worship again and again. And they have to be reminded and God sent prophets. So what's going on here? The Jewish people, chosen people are trying, uh, but they keep falling until ultimately after you got the Persians, they come back to uh, the promised land and then the Greeks. And during the Greek empire, who were ruthless, by the way, but... Thanks, if you read the book of Maccabees, thanks to that family, Judas Maccabees, but, but then the seven sons, that beautiful image uh, in, in Maccabees of the mother who has her, sees and witnesses her seven children being martyred before her very eyes. And she reminds them to stay loyal to the one true God, Yahweh. And they do. You see, ultimately and finally, even though the temple was desecrated, they repurified the temple and they held their ground. They did, didn't give in to pagan worship. Finally, after all these centuries, after all these world powers come and gone, the Jewish people finally held their ground and gave Yahweh his due. And they were basically uh, worshipping the one true God. Thanks be to God. And it's in this time the Romans come on the scene and now Jesus is born. Now what's quite beautiful in all this when does the when does the fulfillment happen? Annunciation. The angel Gabriel comes and appears to a fourteen year old woman. Her name is Mary, and he says, "Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee." And then 
he reveals to her that she will be the mother of us. She will have a son. This son will be called Emmanuel. God is with us. She will name the son Jesus, Yeshua, he who saves. And then he's waiting on her answer. See, Mary has free will. And you can just imagine right there the angels and the saints from all this time have been waiting. All the, all the prophets that were waiting, sorry, in the holding place. They're not in heaven yet, but they're waiting. Please, Mary, say yes. They're waiting and hanging on. What's her answer going to be? Mary, say yes, say yes. She doesn't understand this, but then she says these following words, what we call the fiat. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. And at that moment, God becomes human. God entered into Mary's womb and she became the Ark of the Covenant. Mary now is a tabernacle. Wow. And for nine months, she will hold this baby. She will be a living tabernacle for nine months. Guess how many weeks that is, by the way? 40 weeks. 40 weeks it takes from the moment of conception to natural birth. That is the time. Have you ever heard 40 before? That's right. The Old Testament. Rain 40 days, 40 nights. Moses uh, in the wilderness. There was 40 years in the wilderness. There was 40 days up on the mountain. There was 40 days, of course, Jesus in the desert. 40, 40, 40. What does 40 mean? It brings new life, a new generation. It means it means um, giving a new and something new is going to happen after 40. And so, yes, something new is about to happen, a baby, a new life. 40 weeks, a new life. Now, Jesus is born. He's born in Bethlehem town of David, we, we've got this Mary, and we journey through. She, it's a poor family. She's with St. Joseph. We know all the story. But we fast forward to the adult life, and Jesus now is at the wedding feast at Cana. And what's interesting about the wedding feast at Cana, they run out of wine. We know the story. But then he says, Mary asked Jesus, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And just assuming we need to do something about it. You can do something about it. And then Jesus says, woman, what is this between you and me? He calls his own mother woman. And you might think, that's a bit disrespectful, Jesus. How dare you call your mother woman? Imagine I did that to my mom. Imagine my kids said it to my wife. No chance. Unless she is the woman. Which woman? That woman back in Genesis 3.15. The woman promised from God all those many centuries ago 4,000 years earlier she's that woman the one with the seed the one that will crush the head of the serpent this is the woman so Jesus is saying now the moment I do this the clock's going to start ticking I'm going to be heading towards my passion I'm going to be heading towards what I came to do so you're ready for this and Mary didn't even waste any time with haste the same the same instance as she had from the Annunciation to the Visitation. With haste, she went out to help her cousin Elizabeth. With haste now, she tells them to fill up the jars with water. Do whatever he tells you. Trusting that Jesus is going to listen to the mother, who is, by the way, the queen mother who intercedes for the king. This is what's beautiful. We give out our petitions to Mary, and she then gives them to her son. But that's not the only time you hear Mary called the woman. Let's fast forward now to the cross, at the foot of the cross. And Jesus says to his beloved disciple, the, the model disciple, St. John, the beloved one. Now, when you're a beloved one, he's the model disciple. It's sort of saying this is the pinnacle. This is the best one, right? The one that's led by example. Um, he's the model for all of us, St. John. And so he represents all of us. Now, he, gives, he says to John, John, behold your mother. And at that moment... Mary becomes not only the mother of John, but who represents all of us, all of our mother too. So we can now call Mary our mother. Interesting. And now what does it say to Mary? Does it say, Mary, behold your son? You might be nodding your head. That's right. Or does it, sorry, was it Mary? No. Was it mother, behold your son? You might be nodding your head. Yet. No. He actually says, woman, behold your son. There's that disrespectful word again. Why are you being disrespectful, Jesus? He's not being disrespectful. It's the greatest honor. Because she isn't just any woman. She's the woman. She's that woman. Again, from Genesis 3.15. Promised to crush the head of the serpent. Promised. And then at the wedding feast, that came a woman. And here he is again at the foot of the cross. Woman. 
She's not just any woman. She's the woman. Do you know of any other instances in the Bible? I'm going to give you one more example when we hear about um, this woman. Fast forward to Revelation 12. And St. John has a vision of, a, of, a, of a, a woman. And this woman is crowned with 12 stars, with the moon under her feet. What's interesting about that, standing on the globe, right? So she's, there's a beautiful statue of Our Lady. And, and actually the graphic, I want you to notice something. The, the design and the promo of this very Marian summit has Our Lady with her hands out, standing on the globe. And under her feet, there's a serpent. This is the woman crushing the head of the serpent from Genesis 3.15. And as you can see, Mary is foreshadowed from Genesis 3.15, mentioned by Jesus himself at the wedding feast at Cana, again at the foot of the cross, woman, and again at Revelation, the end of time. She's the woman, that woman, the woman who said yes to God, the woman who crushes the serpent's head, the woman who co works with Jesus in saving us. Thanks to her, yes, it allowed her to bring a God into the world. God came into the world through the woman, that woman, the Ark of the Covenant, Mary, our mother. And so I hope this, this short little talk just really paints a picture of the importance of Mary, who she is. She isn't just any woman. She isn't just a vessel that just gave birth to Jesus and that's it, job done. She's the woman. And this is the one we turn to, to ask for petitions to present to her son, the king. This is the queen mother, Mary, who will take our petitions and present them to her son, the king. Just as Bathsheba in the Old Testament did with her son Solomon, just as many of the queen mothers did, that was their role. This is Mary, the queen mother, the woman, doing the same for us. So let's turn to her more than ever in this time, in, in the month of May, during this beautiful summit, the Marian summit, may we know uh, Our Lady's role, who she is, and never forget who she is, the woman promised from Genesis 3.15. Thanks for listening to this very short presentation. I hope you gained a little bit out of this, and may we really honour and, and understand and appreciate what Mary has done for us. I invite you to visit our website. It's at perusiamedia.com, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. Dot com and we specialize in faith formation resources please check it out we've got some digital um, content resources there lots of free videos on our youtube channel um, we've got lots of podcasts lots of articles and and books bibles resources as well that we we make available we want to really arm people with the tools they need to deepen their faith and to be able to share their faith with others so i hope uh, you gained a lot i want to thank everyone again at this summit and i wish you all the very best make the most out of this time uh, listen to all the talks, write notes, take them, take them to prayer, and may your relationship with Our Lady go to a whole new level. That's uh, another talk for this summit. My name is Shalva Raish, Director of Perusia. I want to thank you again. God bless you.